Thank you for tuning in to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated, our YouTube channel today, Sunday, June 7th in the year 2020. We're located at 1667 South Lauderdale Street in Memphis, Tennessee. And again, we thank you so much for tuning in. And we pray that you will be blessed uh, tremendously. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as you show me me, the real me, we pray that you will help us to see ourselves as we are in your sight. Then help us to rely on you to make us better than we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're working on a series uh, titled, God Show Me Me. In other words, uh, help me to see me as I really am, not as I see me in the mirror or as I present myself on uh, social media, my web, my uh, Facebook page and whatnot, but show me the real me as you see me. And we're, we're uh, building our sermons from Isaiah chapter uh, chapters one through six, and this week we are on uh, chapter five, verses uh, eight through 30. Normally, I would not use this many verses uh, to deal with at one time in a sermon, but uh, I believe uh, uh, have, using all of these verses will help us to have a better picture of w what has God uh, seeing us the way that we are and the world. As I try to uh, share with you, I pray that you would uh, rely on the Holy Spirit to help you not only see how you fit into to God's word, uh, how you are, but how we can tell and see more clearly of what's going on all around us or in the world in which we live. So uh, be prayerful and we'll get through this. Isaiah chapter five, verses eight through 30, and I'm reading from the Living Bible Version. It reads, you buy a property so others have no place to live. Your homes are built on great estates so that you can be alone in the midst of the earth. But the Lord Almighty have sworn your awful fate. With my own ears, I heard him say, many of beautiful homes will lie deserted. Their owners killed or gone. An acre of vineyard will not produce even a gallon of wine. Then uh, 10 bushels of seeds will yield only one bushel of crop. Woe to you who get up early in the morning to go on long drinking bouts that last till late at night. Woe to you drunken bums. You furnish lovely music at your grand parties. The orchestras are superb, but for the Lord you have no thought or care. Therefore, I will send you into exile far away because you neither know nor care that I have done so much for you. Your great and Honored men will starve, and the common people will die of thirst. Hell is licking its chops in anticipation of this delicious marshal, Jerusalem. Her great and small shall be swallowed up, and all her drunken thrones. In that day, the haughty shall be brought down to the dust and the proud shall be humbled. But the Lord Almighty will exalt, will be, is exalted above all, for he alone is holy, just and good. In those days, flocks will feed among the ruins and lambs and calves and kids uh, will pasture there. Woe! to those who drag their sins behind them like a bullock on a rope. 
They even mocked the Holy One of Israel and dared the Lord to punish them. Hurry up and punish us, O Lord, they say. We want to see what you can do. They say that what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right. That black and white, that, that, that black is white and white is black. Bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. Woe to those who are wise and shrewd in their own eyes. Woe to those who are heroes when it comes to drinking and boast about the liquor they can hold. They take bribes to pervert justice, letting the wicked go free and putting innocent men in jail. Therefore, God will deal with them and burn them. And they have thrown away the law of God and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That is why the anger of the Lord is hot against his people. That is why he has reached out his hands to smash them. The hills will tremble and the rotting bodies of his people will be thrown as refuse in the streets. But even so, his anger is not ended. His hand is heavy on them still. And he will send a signal to the nations far away, whistling that those at the end of the earth and they will come racing towards Jerusalem. They never weary, never stumble, nor never stop. Their belts are tight and their bootstraps are strong. They run without stopping. They rest uh, uh, or sleep. Neither do they. Their arrows are sharp. Their bows are bent. Sparks fly from the hooves. Uh, uh, their, of their horses and the wheels of their chariots spin like the wind. They roar like lions and pounce upon the prey. They seize my people and carry them off into captivity with none to rescue them. They growl over their victims like the roaring of the sea over all Israel lies a pall of darkness and sorrow and the heavens are black. That's the Living Bible version of Isaiah chapter 5 through uh, chapter 5 verses 8 through 30. Now let me see if I can make sense out of those verses. Barbara Mandrell, a country western singer, and Percy Sledge, a rhythm and blues singer, both did a version of a song titled, If Loving You Is Wrong. The words, of some, a few of the words of the song says, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to be right. If being right means being without you, I'd rather live a wrong than right. Barbara Mandrell says, my mama and daddy says, it's a shame. It's a downright disgrace. But as long as I've got you by my side, I don't care what my people say. When God's people call evil good and good evil, is our subject for tonight or today. We all have had our moments in life when faced with choosing right from wrong. And I might remind the self-righteous among us that every one of us have been tempted and lost the battle. Romans 3 and 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 7 and 21 says, It happens so regularly that it's predictable. 
The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. But we do have the victory. And it's found in verse 25. Romans 7 and 25 says, The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ came and, and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradiction where I want to serve God with all my heart and mind, but I'm pulled by the influences of sin to do something totally different. The Living Bible version of Romans chapter 7, verse 23 through 25 says, but there's something else deep within me in my lower nature that is at war with my mind and wins the fight and makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. In my mind, I want to be God's willing servant, but instead I find myself still enslaved to sin. So you see how it is. My new life tells me to do right. But the old nature that is still inside me loves sin. Oh, what a terrible predicament I'm in. Who will free me from my slavery to this deadly lower nature? Thank God it has been done by Jesus Christ our Lord. He has set me free. The prophet Isaiah speaks to the Israelites in a stern voice. Whoa! Stop right where you are, he's saying. Woe is a sense of crying out with the intent of warning someone of impending danger that they are about to meet head on. Last week, we looked at verse 1 through 7 where, where Isaiah changed his method of communicating God's thoughts to Israel from preaching verbally to singing a song to persuade or to reach their hearts before it was too late. When my oldest son was a wee lad, I taught him not to get in the street. And then as he grew a little older, I allowed him to cross the street to play with his neighbor. But we, but he had to look both ways before he could cross the street. That was the instruction. One day, as any wise dad would do, I kept out of sight but still kept eyes on him crossing the street after giving him permission to go and play with his neighbor. It didn't surprise me that he would fail to look both ways for danger before crossing. When I was sure that he would not look both ways as instructed and he was in the middle of the street, I yelled his name out loud to get his attention. Here he is now standing in the middle of the street. And now he decides after hearing my voice to look both ways. Woe is God's way of getting our attention so that we can do more than just hear the instructions that he gives us, but that we will do actually what he has instructed us to do. Romans chapter 2 verse 13 says, For it is not the hearer of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. James 1 and 22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Let's walk quickly through the reminders of chapter 5 a remainder, rather, of chapter 5, to get an idea of what God was seeking to warn Israel and perhaps we, the modern-day Israel, 
far before we meet destruction head on. First of all, there's a matter of covetedness. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 8 and 8 through 10. In the disobedience to the law that is found in 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 1 through 3, the rich defrauded and took possession of the poor man's land. You've heard the story before. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 1 says, Naboth, a man from Jezreel, had a vineyard on the outskirts of the city near King Ahab's palace. And one day the king talked to him about selling him the, this land. I want it for a garden, the king explained, because it's so convenient to my palace. He offered Naboth cash if Naboth preferred even a piece of better land in trade. But Naboth replied, not on your life. This land has been in my family for generations. So Ahab went back to the palace angry and sullen, and he refused to even eat and went to bed with his face to the wall. In other words, don't bother me. These wealthy explorers built large mansions and developed extensive farms, but God warned them that their houses would be empty and their harvest meager. Imagine 10 acres of grapevine yielding only six gallons of wine and six bushels of seeds producing half a bushel of grain. When we turn to, uh, to a life of covetousness, we are left to live very unproductive lives. I want to ask, are you living an unproductive life? Perhaps it's because you've turned to a life of covetousness. Jesus now is not telling us to adhere to a life of poverty. When Jesus said, the poor you have with you always, he's not saying that we have to be one of them. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. In other words, Jesus uh, came that we could have more than enough. And that's a long ways from poverty. Now the second woe or the second warning is drunkenness. And that's found in Isaiah chapter 5 verse 11 through 17. In the Old Testament, God did not require total abstinence, but he did warn against drunkenness. Proverbs 20 and 1, Proverbs 23 and 29 through 30, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15, we find God's warnings. This warning is repeated in the New Testament for believers today. In Romans 13 and 13, 1 Corinthians 6, chapter verse 9 and 10, and Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And even Jesus' first miracle was providing better wine than that they had ran out of for their celebration. And this is not condoning drunkenness, but teaching us to rely on Jesus for the best in life. Isaiah describes the people so addicted to alcohol that they began celebrating as soon as they wake up in the morning. And they continued their drinking till late at night. They enjoy partying, partying and get involved in drunken brawls. That's verse 14 of our text. But when judgment comes, 
these same people will hunger and thirst and become a food for the grave. Verse 14. The eaters will themselves be eaten and the proud drinkers will be brought low. And then the next thing that God calls out, whoa, hold on, check yourself. The next one is carelessness. That's found in chapter five of Isaiah verses 18 and 19. Isaiah describes people who are bound by sin and yet speaks frequently of the Lord and his warnings. They are surrounded, they are wrapped up, tied up and tangled up with sin and yet speak frequently of the Lord and his warnings. Sound like some church folks or some religious folks today. They even make fun of the Holy One of Israel and dare the Lord to punish them. In verse 19, the name Holy One of Israel is used 25 times in the book of Isaiah, but these sinners had no respect for that name. Woo. We have skeptical or those not easily convinced of Christ's ability to save and to lead or be Lord of our lives who ridicule and speak lightly of the Lord even today and think that they will get away with it. And now let's move on to deception. The next woe found in verse 20. Deception is speaking of moral standards being destroyed by new definitions of sin. People using God's vocabulary, but not God's dictionary. I'm talking about people that sound religious, but really don't know the meaning. Amos 5 and 7 says, O evil men, you make justice a bitter pill for the poor and oppressed. Righteousness and fair play are meaningless fictions to you. Like today, double speak. This kind of language made it easy to deceive people and avoid a guilty conscience. In today's world, we hear words like increased taxes as being revenue enhancement. In other words, it's really overtaxing the poor, but it's called revenue enhancements. And poor people are fiscal underachievers. Medical malpractice is not the cause of a patient's death. It's a diagnostic misadventure of high magnitude. The Jerusalem Bible translation of Psalms 12 and 2 says it perfectly. All they do is lie to one another, flattering lips, talk from a double heart. And the message version of Psalms 12 and 2 says, everyone talks lie language. Lies slide off their oily lips. They double talk with forked tongues. At Mount Sinai, I've been teaching during pastoral period for uh, a year or two now, during pastoral period, about the idea of respectable sin which highlights the difference between how we view sin 
and how God views sin. We, the worry as something that's not a sin, but God sees it as a sin. My wife calls it dummying down sin. I like that definition. Now let's move on to the next one, pride, found in verse 21 of Isaiah chapter 5. Instead of listening to God, the leaders consulted with one another and made decisions based upon their own wisdom. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And please take time to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 25, especially in the Living Bible version. It will greatly contrast God's wisdom to man's wisdom. Romans 1 and 22 says, claiming themselves to be wise without God, they became utter fools instead. Do not be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. So says Proverbs chapter 3, verse 18. Seven, And we're getting close to the end now. The next woe is injustice. Injustice. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 22 through 25. The judges who were supposed to enforce the law used their authority to free the guilty Ooh and punish the innocent and sometimes murder the innocent. I'm sorry, I digress. They were more interested in cocktail parties than fair trials and making money bribes than promoting justice. Isaiah warned these corrupt politicians that the fire of God's wrath was coming and would burn them up. They were like cut flowers and had no roots. Beautiful for a time, but destined to die and turn to dust. God's hand was raised in judgment and would not come down until he had completed his work. He would summon the Assyrians army from afar and use it to chasten his people verses 26 through 30. What if God in this modern age was to use Russia to chasten America? Now the northern kingdom of Israel would be destroyed and Judah, the southern kingdom, would be devastated but eventually delivered, only to go into captivity to Babylon a century later. God was serious about the nation's sin. And the, if they would not repent and accept his offer of pardon that we studied about in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, then all he would all he could do is to send judgment. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. And verse 10 says, as we, have, as we have therefore opportunity, let us go, uh, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Micah chapter 6 verse 9 says, 
hath the hath he hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Romans ten and nine tells us that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Believe, brothers and sisters, and never doubt. Believe that Jesus died one Friday on an old rugged cross, on a skull-shaped hill, to save sinners. They buried him in a borrowed tomb, but that's not where the story ends. Peter denied him three times before the rooster crowed, but early the third day before daybreak, Jesus rose with, with all power in heaven and in earth in his hands. So be careful how you call evil good and good evil because God is crying, whoa, don't go there because you will surely meet judgment. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, help us to hold to what is true. Help us to walk in your way of love, mercy, and grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you for tuning in to the YouTube channel of the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated. We realize that you had other options and we thank you for choosing to spend this time with us. May God bless you and may God keep you. And continually is our prayer, Lord, show me me as you view me. Take care, and we'll see you next week, the Lord's will. Love you. Bye-bye.